How many births would you say that you've been to? Five or 600 maybe. And then all of a sudden, all these people that were a member of their whole group came into the house and there were probably like six or eight of them. And they grabbed us and like, get over here in the living room. They locked the doors and she's laboring in the bedroom. What made you decide to, to stop doing it? It does take its toll in terms of the lifestyle. So I love the idea of recycling and I love the idea of buying from people in the community to kind of keep the money local. I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could still have reasonable prices and why well, could curate it to be special? What happens when your life's plan comes to a sudden halt? Kim Cash grew up with her eyes set on becoming an actress. Her plans quickly derailed when she found out that she was pregnant with her first child. It was the birth experience of her daughter that helped her realize her true calling of becoming a midwife. I first met Kim in 2011 when she became the midwife to our firstborn son, Alexander, and we've stayed friends ever since. In this interview, Kim and I talk about following your dreams, the lifestyle of being a midwife, and reinventing yourself at any stage in your life. I grew up in Willimantic, Connecticut. Um, I'm the oldest of two children. My parents have two daughters. My sister and I were three years apart. They separated when we were in middle school and got a divorce, so we thought, and then uh, got back together four years later. And so then they, so we just thought our parents were divorced, but I guess some, there was some legal paperwork where they never had to get remarried, but. That was our story. We had divorced parents that got back together. What were your interests as, as, a, as a kid? Did you know what you wanted to be when you grew up? Um, <clears throat> I wanted to be an actress from, from the time I was nine. And I tried out for a play and I got one of the leads when I was in sixth grade and then I had the bug and that was it. I did theater. What kind of turned you on to acting being that young? Was it something you saw on, on TV, a movie you went and saw? What made me want to audition is my parents took us to New York City, and I saw my first play on Broadway. It was Annie. Sarah Jessica Parker played Annie, too. It was the second Annie after Andrew and McCardle, and I was hooked. And I went home and I sang the songs. I actually sang at my school um, on the, in the auditorium her songs, and I, so that's how it started. So everyone told me, do not major in acting because you have a slim to no chance of ever making it as an actress. So that wasn't my, I, that's what I wanted to do. So I, my major was psychology. And I went to UConn. I didn't want to go to UConn either. I wanted to go to Florida. My father said, try it for one year. And if you don't like it, you can go to these other schools. And I applied to, to some schools in Boston, et cetera. So UConn was the cheapest. I said I would try it out. And I hated it being a major in psychology. And I remember crying to my dad. And he said, do what you love. What was the next step after college? What was your goal? What were you going to The goal was to move to New York City because I knew I wanted to do theater. A lot of, it was like half the class was going to LA to do film and half the class was going to New York and that was what I wanted. So I made that pact with my friend in sixth grade that we would live together after college. She went away to another school for theater and then we did. Um, and I was so scared because it was so different then. I had a studio apartment above this Thai restaurant and all you could smell was that food all the time. And <laughs> just a very small apartment with this crazy cat named Madge who would attack you. How did you kind of navigate your way to getting work? Back then, well, I think it's still, it's a paper or a little booklet. It's called The Backstage. And then, you know, you do not, so you just work, you just find out different things, you know, to audition. And then you make connections through your, through other students and your teacher. I would get leads on things and I did some commercials and I did, um, not really theater, actually. I did commercials, except for one movie, Boomerang, with Eddie Murphy. As a, I was an extra and, and an under five, which means you get five or less lines. That was my big thing. So excited. And then we went to see it, and they cut it out, which is, I guess, common. But I got my check from Paramount Pictures for $75, and it was filmed at the, World, uh, the Trade Center. What ended up happening, I actually had an audition with Lucy Kroll, I think it's what it's called, agency. I was so nervous. I had met and become friendly with, um, I'm trying to think of, what's her name, Moira Kelly. She got me into the agency and I went in there and I was like off my game and I had rehearsed. I had, I had this monologue down. I felt really confident going in and I left and I threw up. I was like, oh my God, I was a bottle of nerves. But then it turned out I was pregnant. <laughs> I really didn't think I wanted children, which is so wild now, like how my world changed. 
loves theater. And I just love being with those people, like I said. And I love waiting on tables. And I waited on so many famous people and you just starstruck. And it was just so cool. So then I had Sam and in the hospital. And that didn't make me want to be a midwife, but I realized there has to be a better way to birth. And I wrote a long letter to the hospital. They were like, it was like, you can't have your baby. It's their baby, and, you know, all the, I don't have to go into all that, but medical, like I could hear her crying. I walked to go get her and they're like, no, you can't hold your baby and walk with your baby. No, it has to be in a wheelchair and we have to come get you. And it's okay if they cry. It was just all the things that obviously I don't believe in. And you know, it's okay to supplement with formula. I'm like, oh, I think I just want to solely breastfeed on and on and on. So that definitely turned me off to the hospital experience. And so then I wanted a home birth when I got pregnant again with my second. So I was so resistant to go to the hospital. I like, I held it off to the very end. Got there, it was um, March 31st. And the nurse said, she happened to have all her babies at home. She understood and no one was in the whole hospital on the, in the ward, the maternity ward. So she let me, um, so she was just great. And I got the best room. And she said, this typically happens because women don't want to birth because they don't have their baby on April Fool's Day. So she was born on April Fool's Day, my daughter. And nobody believed us that she was born. And that changed me. I was like, I want to be a nurse. She was amazing. Look at that. And I, she, I, she made a hospital experience so great. And um, I wanted to help people like that. So then when I got pregnant with my son, it was like, well, now we had our own home. I knew I was having a home birth. And after he was born, Nancy Farr, who was my midwife, said to me, why do you want to go into a system that you really don't believe in to try? You're going to be fighting all the time to help. Why don't you do what you really believe in? And I thought, oh, God, a home birth midwife, that's so much responsibility. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have all the bells and whistles and things right there and I, with the liability. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, and she said, well, just go to find, sign up for a midwifery class, um, midwifery class uh, for one of the programs, midwifery schools. Um, and, and do one of the programs and I because I had I, I wanted to learn anyway even if I didn't do it and then I started taking classes thinking well maybe I still will be a nurse mm. first thing that happened when I went to the first day of class it was in Brimfield Massachusetts um, my car broke down and like halfway there and it took over an hour to get there and so I had to figure out I remember my sister-in-law came met me then we had to drive her back and then I took her car so I missed almost half the whole day and uh I was like, oh God, there's sort of a bad sign on the first day. And also how embarrassing they're going to think I'm not, you know, I have this excuse the first day, but this midwife, BJ McKinnon, who I adore, who taught the program said, just that alone is a great prerequisite for being a great midwife. No matter what you figured out how to get a car and everything, you still came and you made it through. And I was like, Whoa. So how long after from when you <laughs> attempted to do the class, going into the class, were you, um, were you delivering? So I know you have to, you have to um, shadow, right? Or however, whatever right. that terminology is. After I took the program, she started to believe that I was serious. And she said, you have to do an apprenticeship. And back then you had to do, she was, she was so strict and hard to be an apprentice with because you did all the, the, you had to stay at someone's house for three days because things happened. And I have three young kids of my own. I had a dog. It was really, and two cats, three cats. It was hard. And then a husband who would get mad. <laughs> But I did that. You had to have a minimum of 50 births as an apprentice. And then you had to have a minimum of 25 as a supervised primary, where people entrust you to give all the care primary, but she supervises you and has to make it for three visits. I had maybe 125 when I finally actually got my CPM, a birth that I had attended. Do you remember the first birth as a midwife? Just Nancy being really hands off. And I was like, oh gosh, no. And, <laughs> um, can you just come a little closer? And she and I was sweating and uh, it was just great. And she said, this is really the easy part. I mean, not that there can't be complications, but you know, and it was, it was beautiful. How many births would you say that you, uh, that you've been to? See, this is why I have the book. I stopped keeping track at the end. It was always, so it's in the hundreds, you know, it, I don't want to exaggerate, but Five or six hundred, maybe. What, what do you love about like the home birth experience, like, or, or what? Just just being a part of it and with these meeting all these families. First of all, I love meeting wonderful people, and you get you become part of their life, a very important part. You bond. There's just mm -hmm. you get it's an intimate relationship, and then the culmination is the birth, which is the hot. You know, I don't even know how to describe it, but. 
Um, and with everything going well, which it typically does, um, it's just transformative. And I remember when my first daughter was born, saying this feeling came over me, again, not wanting to be a midwife, but just as a mother, oh my gosh, I, I did not know this was about, like this is just the love. And the fact that I made it through this incredibly profound experience on my body to create this human, I, and I just was, I felt connection with all the mothers. It might sound corny. I really, really did. It was like all the ancient moms. And I was like, I don't know. It was just, I never forgot that feeling. I still haven't forgotten it. And so that's, I always wish that for something on that level for moms, especially first time moms. And even second, it's a whole nother experience. My, my quote that Nancy uses, gives me credit for is first time it's fear of the unknown. Second time it's fear of the known. A little. So I want to talk about kind of the most memorable, if there is one, one, just a birth that really stands out in a, in a positive way. And then I, I, I would like to talk about the one, I think it was in Worcester. Yeah. Someone who worked at the Romantic Food Co-op that I knew when my kids were little and I volunteered there, had one baby in a sling and, um, we had a nice connection and she decided to have a home birth and she, due to her family and whatnot, I needed to be <clears throat> certified before she would feel comfortable. And that, so it wasn't as important to her, but she wanted to be able to tell her mom and dad. And so anyway, she had the baby in 2004, right after I got certified and she was very well known in the co-op and it was this big thing. She was finally in labor. The labor went on, it got stalled and went on for about five days and there were a lot of people circling around, driving by their house, really, really worried about like, we're letting her stay home too long. Um, her husband was, she was, there you go, very well hydrated, but um, with this maple syrup water that he was giving her and, but it didn't have enough salt component. So she actually over hydrated. Anyway, the baby finally came out. I wasn't feeling well because I had been going after back-to-back -back births. I had this horrible cough. She burst the baby. Baby comes flying out. It was one of these, like, oh my gosh, you almost had to grab the cord. One of those, like, just slipping and completely nothing. No heart tone, nothing. And we it had gotten it, obviously. We're checking all the time, especially in the second stage. Um, so no respirations, no heart tones. And so Nancy and I started working on the baby, called 911. They came, told us to keep doing what we were doing because that's not a typical situation that 911 sees. And we obviously knew the situation better than them. Continued it, had to transfer by ambulance, went to the hospital. Um, and they said the baby, we had finally gotten um, heart tone and et cetera. And uh, so transferred to the hospital and they said the baby is not going to make it. And like this was my first big birth becoming a CPM with someone in my community, well-respected that I loved and that waited. And, um, it was horrific. And I was feeling really sick and then her placenta wouldn't come out. So then she had to be transferred to the hospital and they, um, had to put her under to try to get the placenta out came back and said, there's no placenta. She had to have lost it. So we went back to the house later and checking all the Chuck's vessels. There's no placenta. I don't know how that would have happened. Um, it was bizarre. And they let her say her, her goodbyes to the baby, etc. The baby did this miraculous thing that they've never seen at the hospital. And she is now 18. We got to the house and she was in the bedroom and the labor was stalling and there was another woman and a man there, a couple, and they had some children and they weren't very friendly to us. And they weren't really being, I think they were friendly with her ex-husband. All I know is while we were in there, the ex-husband, the husband, not ex-husband shows up banging on the door, wanting to see her. They allowed him to come in. And then, I mean, her labor completely stopped. We were so scared that what are we going to do? We have to protect her from him because he was really angry. And then somehow he left. And I think the, the, the people who own the, the apartment, the other husband got him to leave. And we were like, okay, phew. Her labor started up again. We had been there for a long time. And then all of a sudden, all these people that were a member of their whole group came into the house. And there were probably like six or eight of them. And they grabbed us and were like, get over here in the living room. They locked the doors and she's laboring in the bedroom. 
threw us into the living room and um, didn't tie us up or anything, but just made us sit there quietly and just berating us. It was horrible. And then Nancy was more, I was just scared. <laughs> I was just sitting there. She's like, we really need, we're midwives, please. We don't mean any disrespect. We really need to help her. She's fine. You are staying here. You are not leaving here. And um, a lot of it's blurry now because it's been so many years, but I was really, really scared. And so was Nancy. And then one of the guys got a call and it was, um, and I don't know if they were in a gang. I don't know what was going on, but they got a call. There was going to be a big fight and it was in Hartford and they all had to take off. What made you decide to, to stop doing it? It does take its toll in terms of the lifestyle and always being on call, which it became hard. I, I kind of used to it for doing it for, from doing it for so long, but um, I have my own children. When they were little, if your birthday is one day and you get called to birth, you could still celebrate. Or I homeschooled for a while. We could always kind of make it work. But then once they went off and my older daughter went off to college, um, I'd be scheduled to pick her up. And after several times of having to tell her last minute, I can't pick you up. And she was coming into to, uh, Providence. She went to school in Boston. She was getting upset and I felt horrible. Um, I thought, oh yeah, I, I, this is just, it was just, it was things like that. They were adding up and I loved thrift shopping. It was a hobby. And I used to love to buy stuff for people or I'd give people my clothes. And um, I thought, what would I do? It's like, it was a fantasy that where I could have just like a normal schedule. So I love the idea of recycling. Like I said, I love, I don't care for fast fashion. And I felt like we had a real need in this town for um, thrifted clothing. And I love the idea of buying from people in the community that can keep the money local. We had a Salvation Army, which everyone loved. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could still have reasonable prices and why well, could curate it to be special? And I love doing that. Um, so I decided, and I also chose Willimantic, where I was born and raised because I felt like this would be a great town for it. And then I love the idea of, I love being around artists, theater, all the realms. And um, so I thought, let's do things there. We could do a little theater. We did, so we did yoga. I did classes. I love to make jewelry and paint and um, bring in local artists and makers. So I did that and it, it took off and then we ended up expanding. I took over the other side of the store and then I combined them here and decided to buy the building. And now I can have more space for more local artists and vendors. And um, we have done theater out in the courtyard and we have bands. And Would you say, are you, are you living your best life right now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, I do have that birth. Well, because I ended up going, in, I'm in a lower responsibility role being an assistant. Um, I feel I still can have my, I can still have that, the birth fix. That was the one thing that was still missing. Because each person that I interview is so different from the next, I always like to kind of get a sense if they have any advice about life or insight or whether it's a saying that they live their life by or just something like that that somebody can take away and maybe would like help somebody. So doesn't necessarily have to be somebody that wants to start a clothing business or be a midwife, just, you know. It's interesting. So I just had this talk with my son yesterday. Yes, my advice, I'm not a big advice giver because it's not how my brain is. I feel this is, works for me. I don't really know. Everybody's so different. I have three kids that couldn't be any more different. And I even said that to him. I said, Gabe, you know I don't give advice. I'll just tell you my perspective. Ultimately, you have to make this decision for yourself. He's at a crossroads. You don't need to pigeonhole yourself in anything that you do. College, if you go to college, if you don't go to college, you get a degree and you decide I, that that's what you have to do. And then, and I heard this, weirdly enough, three times yesterday, after I had the talk with my son, two other people said to me, God, it's not really enjoying what I'm doing, but I feel so guilty because I've spent so much money on blah, 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 whether it's education, whatever. And I'm like, just erase the guilt. Everything leads you, so my advice is, everything leads you to the next thing in life. And it may take a while. It has taken me a while. I have been through a lot and I'm 55. I thought I was 56. The only mind me, I'm 55, so I feel a little younger. I think I was preparing. For my, um, anyway, um, that you can change and keep changing. And it, nothing's ever gonna be perfect, but you don't have to stick with one thing and ever feel guilty.